Hello, my name is Tony. On a very quiet Saturday evening at the old Market Hall Cinema back in 1973, things got pretty damn interesting pretty damn quick. As soon as the projector rolled, in fact. Prime Cut is a film so good I've avoided a formal review for some time now, because I was uncertain of how to do it justice, or effectively describe it in a way which conveys just how good it is and why it should be experienced by a wider audience. For a kickoff, it's tricky pinning it down to a specific genre that people might best relate to. Essentially, it's in a field, no pun intended, of its own. Best I can come up with, and I don't know if this makes it appealing to anyone, is it's a slick and stylish combination of violent urban gangland crime thriller and modern day rural fairy tale Americana style. Let me put it this way, if you stripped all the pagan cult stuff out of the Wicker Man, replaced it with guns, cars, Chicago hitmen and mobsters, set it in a 70s Kansas farmland environment and had it written and directed by a pure and dialectically minimalist Quentin Tarantino minus the verbal bombast and bloat, this is maybe close to what you'd get. I'm going to be as direct and concise as I can in this undertaking. I feel that's the best way to tackle it. So the plot first, that what's it all about bit, and then the why it's so fantastic bit. The stuff people might well have an opinion on and disagree with me about. But that's good. That's healthy, open, tolerant debate. It should be encouraged and facilitated with honest acceptance and good grace. What I will say though, to anyone who doesn't like Prime Cut for whatever reason, you can fuck right off. You're dead to me. Following in the footsteps of three other failed emissaries, Nick Devlin, a super cool Lee Marvin, is a Chicago based enforcer and troubleshooter dispatched by the Irish mob to retrieve a $500,000 debt from Kansas crime lord Mary Ann, a super sleazy Gene Hackman. Mary Ann, along with his brother Weenie, a super dumb mega redneck played by Gregory Walcott when they're not play wrestling in a faintly worrying homoerotic manner, run a rural crime empire fronted by a slaughterhouse and meat processing operation. Drug running, sex trafficking, sausage and burger production are their staple activities. Nick sets out with three young hoods and older driver Shay, William Morrie. He has a history with Mary Ann, not least of all due to his earlier relationship with his now wife Clarabelle, Angel Tompkins, a bitchy and promiscuous femme for Tal. There is an instant animosity between the two men. Nick is all cool, icy composure. Mary Ann sneering and loud with a volatile temperament and shit-eating grin. Nick wants some money. Mary Ann doesn't want to pay up. This isn't going to end well. They first meet in a large barn full of cattle pens. Mary Ann is hosting a flesh auction. Naked young girls are drugged and held in pens for rich old perverts to bid on and take away as sex slaves. It's like a Jeffrey Epstein theme park. Mary Ann tells Nick he can have the money if he comes to the state fair the next day. Nick agrees, but as he is leaving, he makes something of a connection with one of the naked and drugged girls, Poppy, Sissy Spacek in her first credited film role. Their eyes meet, she mouths help me, and it triggers something in Nick. He grabs her and tells Mary Ann he is taking the girl on account. Without giving too much away and going into my usual presumptuous level of detail, the rest of the film is a war of attrition between Nick and Mary Ann, played out against the rustic Kansas backdrop, with fatal mountain losses on both sides. It builds to a cracking action-packed bullet riddle climax at the meat processing plant set during a dark electrical storm. For those who haven't seen it, I'm really loath to spoon feed with spoilers and risk ruining it, so I'm going to do my best not to. Well, I'll try anyway. Director Michael Ritchie cut his teeth on US primetime TV shows in the 60s. His first feature film, Downhill Racer, in 1969, was a Robert Redford pet project about an egotistical and ruthless Olympic skier. Prime Cut was his second big screen outing and the best thing he ever did. Following it was another Redford flick, The Candidate, a political satire, and then Smile, another politically focused venture about a beauty pageant. Good as it got. The rest of his career was frittered away on crappy sporting comedies and glossy uninspired junk. But at least he did one great thing, and Prime Cut is it. Screenwriter Robert Dillon went on to co-script John Frankenheimer's The French Connection 2, and that was almost equal to William Friedkin's classic prequel. Outside of that, he produced a stream of banal shit. His work on Prime Cut is the best thing he ever did. Cinematography is by Gene Polito, who later went on to lens the original Westworld in 1973 and his sequel, Future World, in 1976. His visuals on Prime Cut are crisp, sharp, and rather splendid. Best thing he ever did. 
Score is by Lalo Schifrin. Probably not the best thing he ever did, but he's still composing and has worked steadily to the present day, so at least someone on the production, aside from the actors, had successful careers post-Prime Cut. Theoretically, Prime Cut was so good, many of those who worked on it must have figured they couldn't better it, so consigned themselves to a future life of mediocrity. I don't think it works like that, but who knows. Prime Cut was made and released at a time when Hollywood studios were producing the most artistically challenging movie entertainment in the world. They took risks, bankroll projects that weren't sure bets, not that such a thing exists anyway, but they weren't playing it safe all the time. Chances were taken, some paid off financially, some didn't, but the adventurous spirit that drove the desire to innovate mainstream film artistry was in full flow. It started in the 60s and blazed a trail through the early 70s. Until, of course, Star Wars came along and pissed a stream of buzzing neon hydrochloric acid all over it. But that's a story I'm not going to hack through again. Suffice to say, pre-Star Wars Prime Cut got made. Post-Star Wars, I honestly believe it wouldn't have. Not unless it was set in space and had robots and alien cows in it. This is the why Prime Cut is so fantastic bit. The very start is a compulsive and gripping intro. Cattle are being slaughtered at an abattoir. On the conveyor belt, a human backside is glimpsed, a pair of glasses, a shoe. As the butchered meat proceeds, it is turned into processed mush and then hamburger and sausages. Weenie stops a production line timed to perfection despite his mental deficiencies and selects a string of sausages, which he wraps up and marks with a Chicago address. We next see the sausages when they are revealed to Nick in a bar. They are the remains of the last guy to try and call in Mary Ann's debt. Not the best incentive for the job being offered, but the promise of a 50 grand paycheck sweetens the deal. This is a clear indicator of the type of grisly, dangerous territory we're in. If it leads you to expect a lean, mean, neo-pulp, neo-noir thriller with whip-smart dialogue and well-orchestrated mayhem to boot, then you won't be disappointed. It's exactly what you get. Lee Marvin had by this point persuaded personified the role of a super chilled and lethal criminal hard man in Siegel's The Killers and Borman's Point Blank. Here he's honed it to raise a sharp perfection. There's a savage finesse to his portrayal of Nick along with a dash of steely humanity. He becomes Poppy's protector, treating her with consideration and respect. Wisely the script doesn't make their relationship an age-inappropriate sexual romance. He takes on the role of paternal guardian. It adds another dimension to his character, establishing him as a more relatable but still flawed anti-hero of the piece. No one can convey macho sleaze and villainy quite as effectively as Gene Hackman, and here he's on top form as the morally bankrupt and borderline insane Mary Ann. He's a refined version of his hick brother Weenie, but even more radically afflicted with delusional psychosis and soaring megalomania. Despite all the testosterone and machismo, there are also strong female roles. Angel Tompkins excels as Clarabelle, a combination of pouting angel and dangerous alley cat, who, it transpires, is adeptly pulling Mary Ann's strings. And Sissy Spacek hits the right notes of childlike vulnerability and innocence as Poppy, in what is a more than competent and very impressive first credited movie role. Poppy grew up in a Missouri orphanage until, along with her friend Violet, she was sold by the matron into Mary Ann's white slave rack. Racket. Violet has been claimed by the obnoxious weenie as a dress-up sex doll for his own sordid activities. Prime Cut is peppered with some standout scenes and set pieces. Nick and Poppy being chased across a wheat field by a combine harvester, reminiscent of the crop duster sequence in Hitchcock's North by Northwest. Nick taking Poppy to dinner, she wears a very sheer and revealing dress and attracts the leering attention of an older man, which makes her uncomfortable. Nick scares him into averting his gaze with nothing more than a look and malevolent smile. The final assault on the meat processing plant, a shootout in sunflower fields, with Nick as an avenging angel armed with a double magazine submachine gun, taking down the enemy whilst thunder rumbles overhead. It's all so beautifully filmed and structured. The dialogue is smart, pulpy, and beat poetic. Prime Cut has raw energy and style in abundance, and if it doesn't grip you and keep you watching until the last wholly satisfying frame, my question would be, what's wrong with you? On the downside? What downside? Oh, okay, if we must, although it isn't really. Some have discerned in there somewhere a critique of the Nixon government of the time and the lies being spun to the American people about the Vietnam War. And maybe there are some references, but they don't detract from this film's greatness. You could waste valuable viewing time thinking about it, the allegorical potential of feeding the public processed shit dressed up as wholesome fare, meat being turned into slop and repackaged for mass consumption, the cattle being led blindly to the slaughter, though 
those sorts of things. But look, I've already done it for you, so you don't have to. Not until after you've watched it at any rate. Then there's the female nudity, wherein the girls do look very young. It could be labelled exploitative, but with current day individuals like Epstein and Weinstein and other rich perverted paedophiles and abusers hitting the news with alarming frequency and in seemingly increasing numbers, perhaps it now provokes sober consideration of how little things have changed. Sex trafficking, white slavery, the sexual, physical, emotional abuse and coercion of women depicted in prime cut feels like it's even more real and commonplace in the here and now 50 years later why is that food for thought Earlier I called in a modern day rural fairy tale and there are reasons for my doing so. Juxtaposing things a little, you've got the brave knight in Nick, the princess in peril, Poppy, the wicked king, Mary Ann, the scheming princess royal, Clarabelle, and dimwit, irredeemably vile but loyal brother Weenie. There's even a rampaging dragon to be slain, the combine harvester, a castle to be stormed, the meat processing plant. And they all, well nearly all, live happily ever after in an idealised but possibly unlikely for the critics of the time didn't like it much and neither did the audiences, judging by a worldwide box office take of an estimated $1.5 million. But don't go by that. It's a pacey, ferocious and finely crafted crime fable that represents rewarding viewing and seems ever more resonant with current times, climate and events. Hopefully you'll know if it's your sort of thing and if you do and decide to give it a spin, then my work here is done. People often say, don't take my word for it, but I'm going to be different. Take my word for it. Thank you most sincerely for your time and attention. If you've got the notion, don't hold back on hitting like, don't like, leave a comment or subscribe. Or just pass it all by and go on your merry way. I won't hold it against you. Meanwhile, here's a song called Crooked World. Sort of fitting. And shifted with the weather Storm clouds drifted on forever We felt so gifted And together we could chase the sun You with us were the star parader This darker side of the equator It didn't click until much later You were the only one In this crooked world I've already rolled the loaded dice It hurts to say I love you Don't make me say it twice We all still wait for paying Made it so we kept delaying With the flow, you chose not staying My reaction's way too slow Pain inflicts out of nowhere Turning tricks with a crosshair Making ice picks out of plowshares The cracks began to show In this crooked world I've already rolled a loaded dice It hurts to say I love you Don't make me say it twice Reflected through the prism of time alone Burning down the open road A jet propelled on genou I couldn't save your soul I couldn't save my own Fine hairs and goose flesh mean I'll never be free of you
like a flower You visit hushed on the hour Your angel dust both sweet and sour At least that's how it seemed The night just sweep against the window The moon goes deep with a halo I never sleep these days you must know My dreams are best and dream In this crooked world I've already rolled a loaded dice It hurts to say I love you Don't make me say it twice In this crooked world I've already rolled a loaded dice It hurts to say I love you don't make me say it twice That wasn't nice It wasn't bad